Hello, everybody. My name is Zach Moss. I study Western security policy, and I am still in the process of moving, so bear with me in terms of lighting and all those things if you actually uh, give any sort of damn about that. But anyway, today I want to talk about what had recently happened with the Taliban and specifically some pieces of information that a lot of people don't know that we can bring up and specifically what we've learned from the past with our own history and how we can kind of deal with this sort of situation. So I'm going to take us into a specific kind of area that you might not think about and I'm going to bring in expert opinions on this particular subject. So to start, in case you have not seen the title, the Taliban R word, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on YouTube or not because they seem to send me emails all the time telling me that they're cutting my recommendations for random reasons. So I'm going to say the Taliban had R word and beat a gay man in Kabul after tricking him into a meeting with a promise of escape from Afghanistan. Now to give you guys the really quick version of it, I have my little notes right here with me, is that essentially the militants had pretended to offer the man escape from Afghanistan and I guess what's going on right now in Afghanistan is that the Taliban fighters are allegedly pretending to be LGBTQ activists or individuals who are looking for a quick, as the youth say, hookup in Afghanistan right now. So they would go onto different platforms like Grindr and try to pick up individuals just to either kill them or to, in this particular case, I guess it would signify torture. And so, first of all, I don't think getting on Grinder in Afghanistan would necessarily be the best of options. Now, I'm not victim blaming by any means, and I think that everybody has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and all of that. However, that is kind of an interesting thing to do inside of Afghanistan. Now, full circle right now, hopefully I remember to put some timestamps, how this relates to what we're doing right now. Well, see, the Taliban had, they had done the ultimate no-no which obviously don't kill people, but what they had actually done that's even worse than that in terms of an international scale is that they had gone back on their word. The reason why that is uniquely significant in this particular circumstance is that once upon a time, back in 2017, throughout my undergraduate studies, I had a conversation with a diplomat and I asked him, what was the difference between a government who you think will kill everybody, particularly people at the US embassy, and a government that you might not think would be capable of doing so. And he had said their word. What do we think they're actually going to do? And what have they historically done? Which to me, that makes a lot of sense. However, what the Taliban is doing is they are trying to commit certain acts like this with the anticipation that they'll be able to get away with it while at the same time trying to garner international legitimacy. A lot of us know that. However, here's how it's relevant to all of us back in the roughly 17th century with England. Yes, England. So I'm going to take this a different way. According to Douglas North and Barry uh, Weingla Weingast, I, as some of you guys know, I butcher the holy bejesus out of name. So they are scholars and they had written a journal called Const Constitutions and Commitment, the Evolution of Institutions Governing Public Choice in the 17th Century England. Very long, thought-out explanation, but essentially the story goes like this. One of the reasons why there was a revolution back in the day in England and later on in France and some of these other areas, obviously we know the kind of the story between the king and then people rose up to have a type of democratic system. But what a lot of people don't know is one of the main issues in I guess you could say augmenting crises and escalating tensions between the commoners and the king is the fact that there was two different ways that the king had paid people back on loans. And the first one is that they had a type of institutional infrastructure that had held them accountable, which had only usually came later after the after a war or after the Magna Carta, for example. And so a king could not take money from people without being able to pay them back. The other one was essentially, to put this in layman terms, an IOU. And so oftentimes back in the day, what would happen is that the kings in these different areas, particularly with England, they're fighting a lot of wars, particularly the Seven Year War with France. And what they would do is that they would promise different types of loans to different types of individuals on the ground. And what they would do is they would take enough money and resources to be able to fight off the war, and then they would be stuck with the bill. Oftentimes, because the kings have won the war and they know that they would not be able to be challenged anytime soon, what they would do is that they decided to, in fact, 
drum roll please, not pay off their debts. And as a result, people stopped trusting into the kings and that created a lot of institutional empowerment. So that's where you start to create a parliament and these other sorts of things. So with the increase in local capacity to be able to uh, dictate their own lives through things like uh, economic advance, which is started the Industrial Revolution, that decreased the power of the kings. Full circle to the Taliban. One of the things that we have learned in that particular situation is that if you don't have a type of accountability with the governing body, then people will force institutions to hold the larger body, in this particular case, a king or in the Taliban's position, the president. There's going to be institutions created and put in place in order to force that individual's hand and make sure that they're held accountable. So in this particular case, if we do not know whether or not the king will, or the president in this case, if we do not know whether or not the Taliban will keep their word, then there will be institutions that will be created. Now, obviously, the other question is, how are they going to create these institutions? How long is the Taliban going to be in power for and those sorts of things? But what I can tell you is that this is the worst thing that the Taliban would be able to do for themselves right now, particularly if they're trying to gain international stability. So even though these things sound horrific, which they absolutely are, it is important to kind of look back in history and kind of learn the lessons of what we had done in the past because, well, you know, the cliche saying we all eventually repeat the things that we had done in this particular case they're hurting their own reputation more than it's already hurting and they're proving themselves that while they're trying to govern they're not actually capable of maintaining their word which is going to hurt them in international diplomatic relationships between say the united states or with china who's trying to compete as a partner or iran who's got approximately a million afghanis in their country right now trying to uh vie for work and it's kind of hard to maintain these relations when you can't actually keep your word in smaller promises anyway i think that was an interesting side of everything hopefully you guys got something out of this or at least you weren't bored maybe you could have this as a podcast while you're walking around anyway i'd appreciate a like or at least a subscribe because youtube sent me an email saying that they're cracking down on my media despite showing sources as a result of the fact that they are prioritizing larger media outlets but anyway thank you guys very much Yeah.